You're listening to the Virtual CISO Podcast, providing the best insight on information security and security IT advice to business leaders everywhere. Hi. All right, cool. Uh, hey there, and welcome to yet another episode of the Virtual CISO Podcast. With you, as always, your host, John Verry, and with me today, Ariel Ellensworth. Hey, John. How's hey, it going? <laughs> it's Friday afternoon, sir. Uh, and, uh, I've only got two more meetings after this podcast. So I'm look, I'm We're looking forward there. to the weekend. Yeah. Can you tell me about it? So, uh, I always start easy. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what is it that you do? Yeah, every day. So, um, again, Ariel Allensworth, um, I'm an information security and privacy and AI consultant for um, CBS Pivot Point Security. And I help organizations uh, implement frameworks that help them be provably secure um, and comply with their internal and external requirements. Um, it can come from regulations or contractual requirements or just the organization's objectives. Um, and I also conduct a variety of risk assessments and internal audits associated with different types of frameworks. Um, so essentially that's what I do the majority of the time. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, I, I like to ask before we get down to business, what's your drink of choice? I really enjoy a good hazy IPA. Um, but from time to time, I'll also enjoy a vanilla porter, but I'm a beer drinker. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 well, have you had the no, Breckenridge Vanilla so. Porter? Uh, that's a nice little one. Uh, you can get it on, you can get it on tap, or you can get it in a, a bottle. But the Breckenridge Vanilla Porter is actually pretty, pretty darn good. Uh, I drink a lot of stouts. Porters and stouts always confuse me, despite the fact that I drink a lot of beer. That's yeah, there's such a subtlety between them yeah. that I don't really quite understand. Um, yeah, I, I always kind of tend to think of porters as being a little bit smoky, but then recently I've had a lot of porters that. If I didn't look at the bottle, I would have thought it was a stout. So yeah, I there's some figured gray that out area between yet. the two for sure. Yeah. So, all right. Um, so anyone over the last year that has consumed any type of media uh, has probably gotten tired about seeing articles about AI uh, and the way that it's going to, sh- uh, you know, the way that it's going to um, influence uh, the next century, I guess. Uh, for, I think, many organizations, it creates uh, massive opportunities, right? New approaches, new services, new products, has the promise of driving employee productivity, but it also creates uh, new types of risk that we really don't fully understand yet. Uh, and it also obliges companies to comply with relevant regulations and guidelines. So um, th- today, what I wanted to chat with you about is using AI in a provably secure and compliant manner. Because that's suddenly become a contractual yep. and or regulatory obligation for, for many of the organizations that we work with. So let's start simple. Uh, from your perspective, what are some of the risks that AI introduces to most organizations? Absolutely. So some of the ones right off the bat, and this has a lot to do with the large language models that we've seen come out and become popular over the last couple of years. Um, but misinformation um, caused by the models hallucinating. And um, for those who don't know what that is, the model can just output information. It doesn't mean it's correct. And so when organizations um, either formally implement a tool that leverages AI or um, employees or people um, use a tool informally, sometimes they can rely on that information as if it's ground truth. And that's not always the case. And so depending on um, the processes that the AI tool is supporting, you can have um, risky outcomes, you can have unnecessary bias or even potentially discrimination. Um, So hallucinations and misinformation is, is a, a huge problem if there's not verification done on the output of these models. And then also, uh, there's depending on how models are trained, it's possible if you haven't vetted uh, and tested the model appropriately that you can sometimes extract some of the information that was used to train the model. And that's not always a good idea because um, it could be proprietary information, um, intellectual property, things of that nature. Um, so those are are really the the two big ones. And then another one which has been around for a while, but is just even more pre- prevalent with the popularity of artificial intelligence recently, is automated decision-making risk. 
So this has been something that's been out for a while. So for example, when you go to apply for a loan, um, in many cases, there's an artificial intelligence that uses the variables from your application to determine the amount of risk to the bank of you defaulting on that loan, and then it applies a specific interest rate. Um, now, if the model is faulty or trained on data that is biased, sometimes that can cause discriminatory outcomes for certain groups of individuals. So some people may get a different interest rate based on faulty training data when really they should be getting a more fair or perhaps um, a, a much higher interest rate than the model predicts. And this can apply across many different areas. Um, things like insurance and finance and loans um, is a really good example of this that's been um, implemented long before these large language models. But anytime an organization is trusting a model to make some sort of decision or re even a recommendation that the organization is going to take into account, they have to make sure that they are not um, introducing bias because they're going to be accountable for the discriminatory outcomes. Yeah, so on that hallucination risk, I think the most famous uh, incident was the, the gentleman, the lawyer who goes into court. And he argues uh, case law that the AI engine completely made up. So he he cited up a legal precedent that <laughs> that the uh, you know whether it's ChatGPT or whatever it was it actually hallucinated. <laughs> so yeah, that's scary. And then you know on the on the usage side, right? Um, one of the things I don't know if you see when you chat with people. When I start to talk about AI risk with with some people, they're like, no, no, you don't understand. We don't. We're not doing anything with AI. We are not, and and they mean they're not developing AI-enabled applications. But I think people forget that AI is sort of becoming omnipresent in our lives, and that you know they and their employees are using these uh, tools provided by third parties that are using AI. And I think that theoretically, right, that that imposes them to many of the same risks that they would if it was even their own tool, Yeah, correct? absolutely. Um, there's definitely a risk of, of uh, data loss, for example, from employees putting proprietary information into chat GPT, for example. So um, let me talk about a similar yeah. scenario, right? Yeah. So um, yeah. it's hopefully common knowledge and there should be training within most organizations that tells employees um, you don't send proprietary information to an email address outside the organization, or you don't type in proprietary information into Google, right? And so neither of those things are, are explicitly artificial intelligence, um, but there are policies on that and there's training so that employees know that the best practice is not to um, share that information. Well, artificial intelligence and large language models especially introduces this new type of risks and people may not necessarily understand uh, the activities that that cause risk for the organization. There may be excitement around um, improved efficiency and workflows within the organization. Um, and sometimes that can cause people to miss the risks like data loss from inputting proprietary information into these models. Right. So as an example, if, if, correct me if I'm wrong, you know more than I do, but in chat GPT, right, there is a switch that says, do not, do not allow my data to be used for training purposes or something very similar to that. But if you don't click that, your proprietary data could be, uh, become part of the large language. Exactly. Model, and not just chat GPT, but the different models that are available and different tools that are available, uh, you have to review the terms and conditions and the settings and features of each of these tools to understand, are you going to be compliant with your organization's policies as they are? And it's, it creates, creates a very ambiguous landscape of how to use these tools. Um, and so it can be really difficult for organizations to address this because this came on so quickly. Um, and for example, I use uh, uh, chat GPT all the time. Um, I don't, put proprietary information into it at all. I use it for um, more creative type work. But at the same time, I've read and understand um, CBiz's policy on the use of artificial intelligence. Um, not every organization has a policy like that. Great. All right. So let's talk about something which is driving a lot of the conversations that I'm having with our clients, and I'm sure you as well. Uh, regulatory and, and or what I'll call semi-regulatory guidance. Uh, you know, we've got the EU Cyber Act, uh, we've got NIST 
uh, AI RMF, the Risk Management Framework, the Presidential Executive Order, I think it's called on the Responsible mm-hmm. Use of AI. Um, what is it that they specify? Uh, are they all, are they all pretty similar? What are people yeah, up against? So I'll start with the um, the the EU AI Act. I believe that's the the one that you're referring to because there's also okay. Yes. Uh, so the AI Act was actually uh, adopted by European Parliament on March 13th of this year. Um, so that establishes a regulatory framework on the development and use of AI within the European Union and that affects citizens of the European Union. Um, And so it's very similar to the GDPR that has been out for many years. And so while this is, you know, a a regulation within the EU, it applies in much the same way as the GDPR. And so at a very high level, because it's a quite large, um, piece of, of legislature, but it requires that organizations classify their AI systems into specific risk categories. And then depending on the outcome of that categorization, they have specific requirements they have to meet within the law. And then how you, do you know this is applicable to you? Well, there's a variety of criteria, but fortunately they've developed a tool. It's kind of a quick questionnaire that allows you to evaluate whether or not this applies to you or not. Um, the NIST AI risk management framework, that is not regulation at all. That just provides really good targeted guidance on how to implement uh, a risk management framework for artificial intelligence. And so that uh, specific framework focuses on four areas. Um, it uses a govern, map, measure, and manage model. Um, and that's just really, um, again, has very targeted guidance in each of those areas. It's it's one of the, the pieces here where if an organization is saying, what can I do to address the risk around AI? It is incredibly helpful because it's specific, it's prescriptive, and it has um, really good examples. And it has an accompany, accompanying playbook to go with it helps you understand how it applies to specific types of companies and specific types of artificial intelligence risk. And then finally, uh, with the executive order, that is a little less applicable, I would say, um, as far as like a regulation, because it's more of an order to government agencies to develop standards and develop uh, regulations on um, the use and development and governance of artificial intelligence. So it's the um, executive branch recognizing that um, there are significant risks and opportunities associated with this. And so we need to put some significant resources towards understanding what those are and then take actions to, you know, of course, reduce the risk and take advantage of the opportunities. So they're not really similar um but they're all in a response to this rapid development of artificial intelligence and large language models and for it being incredibly relevant to a much much larger group of people um and with people having a general knowledge of it and so organizations should definitely just watch this space leverage nist ai rmf as um, a really good resource if you want to understand how to manage AI risk, pay attention to the EU AI Act, see if it applies to you. And then, of course, just pay attention to the executive order and uh, news and updates around that, because you may find there are new regulations or new standards that come out as a result of the orders that's been given to the different government agencies. Yeah, I, I would uh, I would argue that the presidential executive order, while not yet important, what it portends is because you know we know from previous presidential executive orders, right? What happens is, uh, you know, this was an example with the uh, NIST eight hundred two eighteen, you know, the secure software development, right? That stemmed directly from a presidential executive order on said on said issues, right? So I think we're really what we look at when we look at the presidential executive order. I think it it gives you an idea of where our government is going, and then we know that our government is increasingly uh, flowing down regulations, you know, to to uh, to organizations within the United it's States. It's really good. It contains some 
uh, excellent information as well uh, to understand how the government views specific risks around AI and opportunities around AI um, and maybe where the government falls short. So what's interesting is as this space moves very quickly, um, there may be portions of the order that are become more relevant in areas that uh, tend to be gaps. Um, but it's it, it provides a really good direction um, and, you know, a pillar for, for organizations to understand um, if there are requirements within the United States government um, that apply to organizations for some reason, we can understand at least where this is going. Um, I think it's going to take some time for these government mm -hmm. agencies to develop the guidance or standards um, that the uh, Biden administration is calling for. Um, but if anyone is curious about uh, the executive order, I highly recommend um, reading a summary of it because there's a lot of very, very relevant information. Yeah, I agree completely. Um, so I know that we as an organization and you personally are pretty excited about the new uh, ISO 42001 standard. It's a certifiable uh, standard relating to uh, AI. Tell us a little bit about what it is uh, and how can it be used to address uh, the risks and the uh, compliance requirements that we've just yeah, discussed. Absolutely. So um, ISO 42001 is, um, is an internationally recognized standard for uh, implementing and maintaining an artificial intelligence management system. And so there are essentially there are um, seven main clauses that establish uh, kind of framework requirements. And then there are a set of controls unique to uh, artificial intelligence that help support those uh, management requirements. <laughs> And one thing that um, ISO does, both with 42001 and ISO 27001, is it requires the organization to comply with its internal and external requirements. So that could be requirements from stakeholders like customers or users or suppliers, also um, legislative and regulatory requirements as well, organizational objectives. Um, and so it's it's a fairly... It seems like a lightweight standard because there's only 39 controls. Um, however, it's it's quite unique. So organizations that haven't uh, taken a formal approach to governance with artificial intelligence yet, they may find it challenging to implement some of the requirements because it requires just new knowledge, new experience, and doesn't necessarily um, act as just an extension off of another standard like ISO 40, uh, 27001. Yeah, it's interesting you say it's only 39 controls. I was a little surprised at first when I thought about that, but in and of itself, the clauses, you know, contain quote unquote controls themselves. They are controls and there are multiple controls within each clause effectively. So, you know, I think if you kind of looked at the sum total, it's probably, you know, twice that or so, you know, of things that uh, prescriptive forms of guidance that it suggests that you consider and potentially. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's, you know, elements within each of those clauses that says you have to do these specific things and then of course mm -hmm. there's some language that says like you said consider this or you should do this um and one thing that's really nice about mm -hmm. this standard is that it comes with implementation guidance and some informative annexes so that you're not just uh left with these requirements and no guidance on how to actually implement them and comply Yeah, so one of the things that I was excited to see uh, when when I first read the standard uh, is that in much the same way that ISO has been doing, the International Standards Organization has been doing for a while, actually the International Organization on Standards, I don't know why it's ISO, it's that IOS. Let's, let's not delve into that right now. <laughs> but, you know, I like the fact that they've maintained a, a consistent management system approach, right? So clause four through 10 has now been standardized across many of the ISO standards, like ISO 9001 and ISO 27001, ISO 27701, and now ISO 42001. Um, so, you know, you mentioned clause four through 10, those seven clauses. Can we just touch on them briefly? Maybe we'll walk through each of them. I'll, I'll throw one out. And can you just give us a couple sentences on 
like what that component is, what that, what that involves. Cause I think it'll give people uh, a decent idea of what ISO 42001 really is. Uh, so let's start with uh, the clause context of the organization. Yeah, so this, I, know, I will talk about most of these as they apply to 27001 and 42001. And then, of course, I'll make call outs that are specific to 42001. So this one is, it's pretty much equal for both. You have to understand the context, like within information security. Why does information security matter or AI matter to your organization? Well, it could be okay. there are specific internal and external requirements. Um, it may be that you're developing a product that you need to secure or that you need to leverage AI uh, in order to use. Um, and it helps uh, establish really the scope and the boundaries of the management system, both for information security on the 27,001 side and AI with 42,001. Um, so yeah, this is really all about scope in the management system, the internal and external um, stakeholders and what are their requirements. Yeah, increasingly, like we've already seen it with one of our customers become a contractual obligation. And now we're going to see it become a regulatory, uh, a, a compliance requirement, right? Uh, regulatory compliance, like with the EU. Exactly. Uh, AI. And you may have uh, suppliers that you may get a questionnaire from a supplier that you have had for a long time. And they may be asking you, um, do you use artificial intelligence? And you may be somewhat blindsided by these things, but um, if you were to get that, that would be something you'd want to document as an external requirement is that your suppliers um, or your customers or your regulating bodies have these requirements for information security or artificial intelligence. Yeah, clause five is around leadership. Yeah, so what does that entail? You can establish a management system. How is it going to be managed? You need to have leadership involvement and commitment um, and a strong tone from the top in order for the management system to be effective, to have effective governance of information security and artificial intelligence, effective risk management. Um, and so this is establishing how leadership is committed, what are they committed to, um, developing uh, an artificial intelligence policy. So this is specific to 42001, is identifying the artificial intelligence policy. What is the organization's objectives for artificial intelligence? Because this can drive a lot of the subsequent or topic specific policies unique to artificial intelligence. And then of course, it also establishes the relevant roles and responsibilities within the organization to ensure um, that the management system can achieve the objectives set by leadership. Gotcha. Uh, close six is planning. So this is about how can the organization uh, assess artificial intelligence risk and treat that risk. Um, and so this is establishing the processes for doing that. What are the criteria with which the organization needs to, um, you know, assess and treat that risk? Um, there's an additional component here that is not seen in ISO 27001, and that has to do with an artificial intelligence impact assessment, um, as well as establishing artificial intelligence objectives. So the AI impact assessment may be something that could be um, informed by ISO 27701. So organizations a lot of times implement a privacy impact assessment to understand specific risk unique to um, privacy, PII, personal data. So that is a similar approach here with artificial intelligence. How are these systems going to impact individuals, groups of individuals, or society? You know, It depends on the application of the artificial intelligence system, um, but this is something that is, is new here, is making sure you have a risk assessment a risk treatment plan for artificial intelligence within the organization, but also that you conduct specific AI impact assessments, and those can be used to inform your risk assessments. Support. So this is important because it helps the organization establish, um, you know, what are the resources that are required in order for you to achieve your artificial intelligence objectives for the management system. So establishing the, the, the human and capital resources, um, system resources, um, things of that nature, and then also ensuring that you have the right people, the right knowledge, um, the right assistance. 
to develop the management system, maintain the management system, and then making <laughs> sure that you effectively uh, communicate the implementation and maintenance of the management system so that all of those roles and responsibilities that were identified um, in the earlier clause, that all of those people understand what the, their responsibilities are and what their roles are. So effective communication of that, effective communication of policies relevant to the management system. Um, and then, of course, uh, recording and maintaining any documentation, both required by the standard, but also required by the organization in order to um, ensure they're compliant with the standard. So something that may not necessarily be required by the standard is you um, measuring how many users uh, interact with your AI application every day. Standard doesn't specifically require that, but it does require that you maintain metrics and that you monitor the AI system. And so in order to do that, you would then have required documentation because the organization chose that specific metric. Yeah, and, and under seven, they cover what I think is critical around AI is awareness, right? Because if everyone isn't aware, like you said, we can encumber, somebody can you know, procure a new SaaS application that's making some type of business decision on our behalf. And if they're not aware of, of the implications and what our, 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 our acceptable use of said applications is, and what processes they need to go through, we exactly. get ourselves in And those trouble. roles and responsibilities can span from, from top management all the way down to end users. It can spread to customers, um, external users of the artificial intelligence systems, um, developers and engineers, just a variety of people, um, internal and external towards the organization. And if those are not communicated effectively, um, then the management system is going to falter. Uh, clause eight is around so operation. This one is how, how is the organization applying the, um, items that, that we described under the planning phase, right? So is the organization conducting their AI risk assessments and treating AI risk based on the methodology that was established in the planning phase? Um, is the organization conducting the AI impact assessments? Uh, is risk being effectively treated? Um, and then of course, um, there's always a, a measure of continuous improvement, but I'll kind of hold off on that until we get to the, um, the last clause. Yeah, and if you think about it, this if you remember the old uh, early days of ISO, we used to call mm -hmm. it Plan, Do, Check, Act. Yeah, so you, you talked about planning, operations is the do, and now we're about to go into check and act, right? Uh, so, so the next one, uh, Clause 9, is around performance yeah, evaluation. So how do you know that your management system is performing as intended, right? What are your objectives that you established um, in the previous clause? And um, are you meeting those objectives? In order to do that, you need to monitor um, specific metrics that map to those objectives. And then you need to evaluate those measurements and then make sure that you're communicating those uh, measurements of effectiveness to top management so that they can adjust the management system as needed to make sure that they're achieving those objectives or maybe changing the objectives or changing the metrics themselves. And then it also um, establishes requirements for making sure the organization has an internal audit program. And that's part of that monitoring and measurement requirement. Uh, you can have metrics, but you also need to have an independent internal audit of the management system and the methods used to um, maintain that management system. And then the final, and no, then sorry, the, finally, the final piece of that oh, is that sorry. management yeah. needs to review, um, there needs to be a management review of the management system on a regular basis. And so they'll review things like um, audit findings, uh, results of a risk assessment, any internal or external changes that might affect the management system. Uh, and then of course, just input. And that, that management review um, should be conducted by a committee of top management that includes relevant stakeholders. So for artificial intelligence, this could be um, your CISO, it could be your CIO, your CTO, uh, business stakeholders, um, artificial intelligence um, experts, for example. 
And yeah, your developers. I mean, if, if, if you are developing your own L large language models, right, it's going to be the people that are the machine learning experts that have exactly. to be integral to this, right? Yeah. And then last but not least. Uh, so this improvement. one, um, ISO is, is, has a strong, um, a strong approach for continuous improvement, right? This isn't really like a pass fail of this standard. It's that you can implement something, identify gaps, um, identify the effectiveness of the management system, and then just continue to improve it. Strengthen your um, your implementation of, of management clauses, strengthen your implementation of controls. And so this clause establishes requirements for the organization to do that continuous improvement. So if there are audit findings, management should review those based on the requirements of the previous clause, and then document what's being done to address those findings. What is being done to um, address new risks that are identified or to potentially uh, treat existing risks that have changed. Maybe the impact or probability has changed um, or there's changes within the organization um, that reduce the effectiveness of existing controls. So there needs to be uh, processes put in place to ensure the organization is continuously improving the AI management system and the information security management system, as is the case in ISO 27001. And then the second component here is that the organization understands uh, and establishes a methodology for um, uh, identifying nonconformities to the standard and then what actions to take in order to address those nonconformities. So this is similar to the audit findings because that's where these nonconformities are going to pop up. Um, but the organization needs to have a formal process for what to do when nonconformities uh, are identified. So for any of our listeners that are ISO 27001 certified, uh, this is probably pretty comforting because it all sounds darn familiar. You know, effectively what we're just doing is replacing, you know, it's now instead of an information security management system, it's an artificial intelligence management system with uh, the vast majority of the components of it being uh, very similar uh, to near identical. So um, you mentioned earlier that uh, we've got these controls. So it was interesting to me. We have Annex A controls, like we have Annex A controls in ISO 27001, you know, which are, you know, like you said, 39 uh, fairly uh, prescriptive forms of guidance to help us uh, understand what does it mean, right? And how do we control the risk associated with uh, AI? And then um, what I thought was interesting is that they added the Annex B, which you re referenced before the implementation guidance. You know, that was sort of like a shorthand version of ISO 27002, right? Uh, like it from from an analog perspective. Yeah, it, I was uh, pleasantly surprised when I first, first read the standard because um, the, a lot of organizations don't know uh, that ISO 27002 is out there. Hopefully they're informed over time, but um, I've definitely spoken with... Um, organizations that they've implemented 27001 and just have not really leveraged the guidance from 27002. And so for ISO to include the guidance in the same document um, is incredibly helpful. So uh, pleasantly surprised. So um, as you know, GPT, at least based artificial intelligence, uh, by definition, involves massive uh, training data sets. And increasingly, these data sets include personal information. Um, can you talk a little bit about how ISO 27001, ISO 27701, ISO 42001, in my mind, at, for many organizations, that they're ultimately going to form like sort of the holy trinity of, you know, provable, uh, demonstrable security for, around privacy, personal information, and artificial intelligence? Yeah, exactly. So um, the combination of those, or even just ISO 27001 and 42001, um, is that it's it's an integrated management system. So when we went through the clauses, those were the majority of that information was applicable to both 27001 and 42001. So for organizations that are looking to address information security, privacy, and artificial intelligence risk and internal external obligations, it's 
much more simple to do an integrated management system because you can enhance, let's say you're ISO 27001 certified, you can enhance existing documentation, existing processes um, to set the, the framework yes. for the AI management system because you already have a lot of those things in place. You have a management committee, management review, um, and, and some relevant policies. And so then you just have to do some of the work that's very specific to ISO 42001. And then a lot of the the concerns and risks associated with artificial intelligence um, can have something to do with the security protection of personal data, because you're right, a lot of times that's included in the training data sets, or a lot of times that's included in information that's collected and processed through an artificial intelligence application. Um, so that's one of the amazing things about 42001 is not only is there a, a fairly small control set, but the clause requirements align really well with ISO 27001. Quick question for you. I hadn't thought about this prior. So ISO 27001 and 27701. 27701 actually alters the construct of the 27001 clauses. Uh, and it's intended to run mm -hmm. in a more unified way, right? Instead of having information security and a privacy management system, you have a, a lot of people call them PIMS, right? A, a privacy and information security management system. Is it your thought process that we would, with clients that are doing all three, that the AI management system would sort of be integrated into that same and we'd, we'd, we'd run this through that same single logical construct? I'll say... Um, it depends. So generally, yes, um, because it's just more efficient. There's a lot less duplicative effort if you um, integrate those things together. So the areas where it might be separate. So you may have an information security management committee. And if you're to do something that's integrated, you'd have an information security, privacy and artificial intelligence management committee. But depending on the size of the organization and the, the implementation of artificial intelligence and, and how that applies to the organization, you may want to have um, a subcommittee, but ultimately keeping the, the leadership commitment, the accountability, the roles and responsibilities, um, integrated is really important. I think that the separation of these things would really happen down at the tactical level with topic specific policies and unique processes to information security, to privacy, and to artificial intelligence. Uh, that makes complete sense. Um, so what I'm finding is that this area is so new that many of the clients that I'm talking to sort of don't know where to begin or the clients that we're acting as a virtual CISO for, they just, they know they need to do something, right? They're becoming aware of that, but they don't really know where to start. So if somebody's listening and they're, they're not ready to jump right in and get to like an ISO 42001 level of dealing with AI, what was your guidance for where they should yeah, start? Yeah, so I would provide guidance from a couple different perspectives. So the first one being organizations that aren't developing or implementing AI formally, um, but whose employees may be leveraging um, kind of informal or ad hoc AI applications. So consider developing an artificial intelligence use policy similar to an acceptable use policy. You want to understand well, how are how is the organization using artificial intelligence uh, informally and what risks does that introduce? Uh, and then establish requirements in your policy that can help um, reduce some of that risk. And so I would say this will apply to almost any organization out there. So if you're not approaching AI, it's not something that, that you're thinking about at this time. Um, your employees probably are because the tools that are out there today uh, can make almost any process somewhat more efficient in some way. So somebody out there is probably using it in your organization. So at a minimum, consider developing an AI use policy. There's really good guidance out there, um, especially within the, the NIST AI risk management framework. Um, there's enough information in there to help you understand what are some of the risks associated with this, uh, and that can help you develop requirements to put in a policy. And then the... Yeah, I like what you said, though. 
Oh, I was just going to say, I was going to double down on what you said, because I don't know that I've emphasized it quite enough when I've chatted with clients is that, you know, don't create the, you know, like a lot of people are going to go to the internet and download a policy or they're going to ask someone to give them a policy, whatever it might be. But you really need to understand risk before you de deploy a policy because the policy, you know, policy is a control and controls are mechanisms that reduce risk. We don't really know what an appropriate policy is unless we understand the risk associated with exactly. our use, correct? And absolutely use use templates. If Go find templates and see what other organizations are doing. Um, but you have to contextualize it. And how you do that is understanding um, yes. the way it's being used in your organization and the risks that it presents. And I don't think people understand, like I was having a chat with a client the other day and they were like, well, we don't allow, we block chat GPT. I'm like, do you block Bing? And they're like, no, I'm going <laughs> Bing's got chat GPT built into it, right? So yeah, anyone who's use, using Edge is, is, use, is using chat GPT. And I said, on top of that, virtually a significant percentage of the SaaS applications you're consuming, right? And, and we see numbers like a, a, a typical enterprise is consuming a thousand SaaS applications. What percentage of those SaaS applications are applying some level of artificial intelligence, right? If you've got uh, you know, all of your human resource tools, if, and that's where danger comes into play. You know, if you've got a, an HR application that is um, scanning and reviewing and screening resumes, you know, they're using AI. And if they're using AI and they're using a biased model, right, you're going to have, you could potentially have an issue there. Most of the security tools out there now, right, that are, that are doing uh, threat, threat intel and, and uh, assessing security logs and things like that, they're using AI. So there's so many tools that are using AI, right? We, not only do we have to have that policy, but then we also have to, we got to, like, isn't part of this all figuring out which, one of, which vendors are actually using AI? And then making sure that they have the right control mechanisms in place exactly. to protect us. So you have you can have ad hoc use of uh, AI in the organization. Employees using things like um, ChatGPT and Bing and Copilot and and things yeah. like this. Um, but then there may be applications that have been formally approved for use in your organization that have new features that leverage AI. And so. Um, if you're going to implement a policy or even if you're going to do more in this next category I'll talk about, do an assessment. How is artificial intelligence being used in the organization? And you need to define what is artificial intelligence mean to this organization. There's a variety of definitions out there for what it means. Um, so that you need to establish what your organization uh, defines artificial intelligence to be and then go out and find um where in your organization that that's being used. Gotcha. Um, so that implies to me that um, updating your third-party risk management program, vendor due diligence program, whatever you're calling it, vendor risk management, to uh, ask those, begin to ask those questions about the use of artificial intelligence and how they're, uh, they are or are not uh, complying with the guidance, good guidance that out there, that would be another next step recommendation beyond getting that policy, you know, understanding risk yeah, so policy place. Yeah, so that's going to be a really good opportunity uh, to determine how artificial intelligence is being used in the organization. A couple of angles here. So if you ask your, your um, uh, SaaS well, providers, well. do you leverage artificial intelligence to provide these services? Um, you may find in a lot of cases they say yes and you didn't know this previously and it may not be because they implemented artificial intelligence recently because of large language models although certainly that's a case a lot of times but maybe you're just discovering that they've always used artificial intelligence uh, in some capacity and then because of the awareness as has happened with the rapid development of large language models recently you now have to pay attention okay what does that mean so there is the aspect of understanding um, how do we reach out to our vendors and understand uh, how they're using artificial intelligence in the services they're providing us, but then also how are they using artificial intelligence within their organization and what risk does that present just by them using artificial intelligence? So they may use chat GPT internally. It may not be used in a way that, um, is within the service provided to you, but it might introduce additional risk for that organization being able to provide that service to you effectively. 
Yeah, and I, I like something you said, and I never thought of it. The, the sort of defining what AI is within the context of organization, because I don't think people realize how pervasive it's become, right? You know, anyone that sits down in front of their TV and hits Netflix, that recommendation engine is, is artificial intelligence. I mean, you know, if you are talking to, and I won't use her name because she's sitting next to my desk, but if you're talking to a, a, a virtual assistant of that nature, uh, you know, artificial intelligence, if you're talking to your car, uh, if, you know, all of these systems, right, are using AI at this point. So it, it's a lot more pervasive than we think. And I think that organizations need to be aware yeah, of that. Something that it can be really easy to get caught up in the hype of, of artificial intelligence right now. Um, but what has happened recently is the relevant development of large language models where it doesn't take uh, uh, data scientists to interact with these models. Anybody can interact with these models and f find benefit in that. And so um, there is unique risks with large language models, and that's causing a lot of the reactions like the executive order, the AI Act, um, and different standards and frameworks coming out to help people um, manage risks and opportunities with these things. But then that's also causing people to say, okay, wait a minute, there's artificial intelligence outside of large language models, how do we apply this to artificial intelligence that we've been using for years now? Yeah, one, one pointed risk I'll point out that I just heard about through a client was they were piloting Microsoft Copilot, which I think is going to be a fantastic product. I, I'm, I'm excited to use it. I hope I get a chance to use it soon. Uh, however, if you do not have the right restrictions on data sources within your organization, Copilot finds them and uses them. So they had a human resource folder that didn't have the right permissioning on it, that had confidential salary information on it. And somebody asked Copilot a question and was able to retrieve uh, all of that data. Uh, so, so for anyone who's thinking about deploying Copilot, do understand that there are probably some things you need to do ahead of that uh, to avoid anything uh, unexpected. This is a really good opportunity to talk about how um, ISO 27001 is really relevant here and supports ISO 42001. So in this instance of access control, right? Governing access control for users, governing it for systems, that's been a lot of the context um, for, for decades now. And now we have to say, how do we uh, appropriately manage access for artificial intelligence systems? Because they are kind of in the middle between systems and users. It depends on how you implement them. Um, they, it could behave like a user. Um, but in the case of the, the HR file, uh, it just being a permissions issue, that's just a simple information security control. But the context wasn't there. Right. Yeah, pretty cool. Uh, we beat this up pretty good. Is there anything we missed from your um, perspective? I did want to point out something uh, else about ISO 42001. So we have Annex A, which are your controls, and then we have Annex B, which is the guidance on how to implement those controls. Um, but there's also um, an Annex C and an Annex D. And so the Annex C provides uh, both those two annexes are informative, so they're not requirements. But Annex C provides really good guidance on uh, and examples well, of AI related organizational objectives, as well as what are some of the potential sources of artificial intelligence risk. So it's just another step above guidance and helps organizations really understand the context of uh, the AI management system. And then finally in Annex D, um, it contains some brief guidance on okay. integrating the AI management system with other management systems like it mentions 27001, 27701, and uh, even ISO 9001. Um, so it's just some extra information that really rounds out the, the standard documentation. So I think that organizations that, especially who have already implemented yeah. ISO 27001, should have no issue understanding how to uh, really implement the management system. I think where the gaps can occur, especially the knowledge gaps, is how do you develop secure artificial intelligence, right? You have to have 
the right resources in your organization to understand that. Um, and that goes back to the clause requirement of having appropriate resources, appropriate competence uh, with those resources as well. So I just want to sh give a shout out to Annex C and D because um, that goes kind of a, above and beyond what 27,001 does. I, I like your pointing out the 9001 as well, because increasingly we're starting to see people talk about using 9001 um, to ensure the quality of their SDLC, their development processes. And I think in light of the potential risk associated with AI, right? Because you were talking about just risks about decision making that was around data. And we do have systems that are auto like autonomous vehicles, right? They're making decisions that could have life and limb or weapon systems, targeting systems, things of that nature, right? They all have life and limb. Uh, implication. So ensuring the quality of those development processes around the AI process, I think is a, you know, a fantastic thing. And I, and I agree with you that, you know, instead of maybe having a holy trinity, a holy quartet, uh, might have been a better term earlier where you're actually using all four of those standards that you talked about. So thanks Absolutely. for bringing that up. Um, so give me a real world of fictional character you think would make an amazing or horrible. We can do CISO. We can do uh, AI lead. We can do whatever you want. Um, so I will do. I would say I'll go with a fictional character uh, as a CISO, um, and this may be controversial, but I, I guess you could go both ways. And I just picked out the qualities that made it go this way. So I think Darth Vader would make a horrible CISO, and here's why. So he is ruthless, um, but he's effective. But ultimately. Um, leading out of fear will build a rebellion. And so if that were to apply in an organization, um, you are going to have a much more effective um, uh, information security governance program if your the people within your organization understand it and support it versus being just forced to comply with it and it making their lives difficult. So I thought that's kind of a fun little way to, to do it. But I don't know, maybe Darth Vader would be an effective CISO. But in the end, who knows? Uh, it, it, a CISO who could, quote unquote, <laughs> use the force? Come on. That's not a good CISO. You, uh, he, uh, maybe he can see the cyber attacks this. before they come. <laughs> All right. Uh, if someone wanted to uh, get in touch with you, what's the easiest yeah, way to do so that? You can uh, reach me at ariel.allensworth <laughs> at cbiz.com. Um, or you can look me up on LinkedIn. Um, just search A R I E L Allensworth. Sounds good, man. Appreciate you taking time on a Friday afternoon and uh, shedding some wisdom you here on AI. I appreciate this. Uh, I, yeah, I, I couldn't tell. <laughs> Thanks. All right, man. Have a great Friday. Uh, hold on one second.